So welcome everyone to this October session of Let's Code Together. My name's Jane Knight and I'm an MSSO instructor and I'm also joined today by my colleague Dr. Caroline Wilson, one of our medical officers. Hello everybody and a warm welcome from Berlin in Germany. Welcome back, particularly if you've been to some of our sessions before. As you know, we do these, or these webinars once a month. So the session will be recorded, and if the audio quality is good enough, we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. Another new thing in the last couple of months is that we now offer a webinar attendance certificate for attending the webinar. This is issued following the prerequisite period of attendance. So what we mean here is that we do expect you to attend as near as you can to the whole webinar, allowing for a few minutes either side, perhaps if you if the webinar overruns or if you have trouble joining. But generally, you need to attend the whole session. And it, the certificate will be sent to you as a PDF file via email within a couple of days of the webinar. So just starting now, just the first slide you have seen before, I'm sure, MEDRA was developed in the mid-1990s as an ICH initiative. At the time, the MEDRA MSSO, or Maintenance and Support Services Organization, was put in place to maintain and distribute MEDRA, and the activities of the MSSO are overseen by a management committee with representatives from across the ICH regions, both the industry and the regulatory authorities. The material that you're going to see today is the property of ICH, just as MEDRA itself is owned by ICH. So if you do choose to use anything from the, what we're going to present to you, you must acknowledge ICH as the owners. We want the session to be as interactive as possible. We will call it a workshop because as far as possible, we want you to participate by asking questions and making comments. And you can do this using the questions panel and in your GoToWebinar software. Sometimes you may have thoughts on a term and we may not all agree on the term that should be selected. So sometimes in these scenarios, we may have to agree to disagree and just move on in the interest of time. Unfortunately, we can't take requests today in this session to code a specific verbatim through the questions, but what we will offer you is at the end there will be an option for you to propose examples for us to consider to use in future sessions, but please do try and make sure that these would be of interest to the wider audience, not something that's very specific to your area of work you'll see some of the examples we're using today have come from requests from previous attendees. We're going to use a polling application that allows you to join in and vote on some of our, or all of our examples. And you can do this either on your mobile phone or an internet browser. And you can do it by, if you open a browsing app window, like Safari or Chrome or one of those Edge, and you type in pollev.com, pollev.com, that's all you type in to the URL bar. You then see the screen you, that is on the, script, on the page now, and you enter my name as the username, Jane Knight 855 So if you, don't, if you don't catch these details here on this slide, they're available in the chat, you can look at them there. And the other alternative, simpler way of doing it is you can just scan the code. If you scan the square barcode, the QR code, you'll be able to enter directly and you don't need to put anything in. It's completely anonymous. We don't see what your vote has been. We can't track. It's not a, a competence assessment. It's just to participate in the quizzes. So as to give you a taster of this, I would ask you here, what, where are you joining from today? This is the first question. Where are you joining from today? Let me just check it while you're voting. Let me, ah, oh, yes, it's working. I can see. Oh, number of you across Europe. India. I see Greece. Greece. Calimera. Spain. Buenos dias. France. Bonjour. Germany. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So welcome, wherever you are in the world, welcome today. 
the couple of extra questions we've added, we because as you know, we can't currently do face-to-face -face training, and this is why we're trying to make our session as interactive as we can with polling. So if we were to ask you, in your opinion, when do you think we should resume face-to-face -face MEDRA training? We're monitoring the situation, and by canvassing your opinion like this, it allows us to get a feel for how you feel about it and when we should. A lot of you are not sure. Like us, you're not sure. So thank you for that. I've just got one more question related to that. Has everyone voted? The second question is, when we do resume, would you be willing to travel to attend face-to-face -face training or do you prefer virtual training like this webinar today? How do you feel about it? Okay, I think that's that. Everyone voted that wants to vote? Good, thank you. This next slide explains that during the session, it might be useful for you to have access to a, a browser. Now, you can use your own browser or you can use your own credentials to access our web-based browser. But if you don't happen to have a browser to hand and you don't have the credentials, you can access our web-based browser by going to the website. And there's the I've shown you there of the home page where you can access it. So if you take a snapshot of this slide, this is a demo password. It'll be active for a week um, and you'll be able to see, you'll be able to log on and use the browser. The details are in the chat as well. Caroline will put the details in the chat for you. So another thing we say every session, sometimes when we code, it is a challenge and there may not always be an exact match. Sometimes there may even be more than one possible approach and more than one LLT that you can choose. And even the points to consider coding guidelines document does also offer us options in places. Sometimes it's a question that we all understand the term differently and, it, it's that, and we have a different view of the term. But the best we can do is to code as reported and represent the events that are as best we can with a best approximation is what we like to call it. Overall, we always code as reported without making any assumptions or inferences. And what we sometimes say is it, it's like pictures. So here's a picture. I was traveling about, out and about in the UK last week and I came across this. And when I took the picture, I looked at it and I, I was like, my brain initially saw, well, what is it? Is it a lamb, a little cute lamb there in the, in, in the, in the bushes? And when I looked twice, it's actually two lambs and it was only that I was talking to a friend and they said actually there's two lambs there and we said sometimes so I find the verbatim terms are like this I can see it one way and when I show it to Carol Ann and say shall we use this for our session she'll point out a completely different understanding so this is the picture we've chosen to use this month Medical judgment. Coding is a balance between applying rules for consistency, but also using medical judgment that manages the risk to patients. Medical references are helpful and to us in understanding the reports and making decisions about how they should be coded. And you'll see that today in the examples we present. Sometimes it may also be necessary to request a new term to be added to MEDRA to represent the reported concept. So having said all of that, let's code together. And I'm going to switch off my camera at this stage because I can find it distracting. So there we are. Carol Ann, I'll hand over to you for our first example today. Yes, here we are. So in our first example today, we carried it over from the last session. It is reported that the patient's treatment cycle was postponed due to a COVID-19 infection in a relative of this patient. Now, how would you interpret these reported events and what needs to be captured? What would you propose? Which LLTs or LLTs would you select for the reported patient's treatment cycle was postponed due to COVID-19 infection? in patient's relative. What would you propose? Temporary interruption of therapy, treatment delayed 
and coronavirus infection? Any further treatment non-adherence, sick relative, COVID-19, inappropriate schedule of dosing, exposure to COVID-19, delayed dose administered and community-related COVID-19 exposure, treatment delayed, product delayed due to pandemic. So this is rather uh, something about the product delivery, treatment delayed, sick relative, unclear reporting. So somebody would even query this term. So there was a reason for postponing the treatment. It was not an error by the patient. So things like inappropriate schedule, delay or whatsoever would suggest that there was an error by the patient, but it was not a medication error in this instance, because uh, we know that the, there was a change in therapy and that this was because of a COVID-19 infection in a close relative. So this was not under the control of the patient. Uh, but ex the, the verbatim itself is quite vague. We do not know whether this scenario describes an exposure to COVID-19 or whether the patient needed help from the relative due to physical disability, for instance, um, for example, to get his medicines from the pharmacy or for seeing uh, the physician to get a new prescription. So we don't know whether it was an exposure we don't know what, what actually happened. The, the term or the verbatim is quite vague. So thank you for participating here. And let me switch screens and go to the browser. So let us check. There was a change in therapy and we do not have any indication that this was due to a medication error. Because if you look into the Medra concept descriptions and search for medication error, you will see that this is defined as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional, patient or consumer. So this is really important to know, in the control of the healthcare professional, patient or consumer. This is not the case in our, uh, in our example here. So the a close relative fell sick. This was not under control of the of the patient, and that's why um, the the treatment of the patient had to be postponed. So it was rather um, something that um, relates to um, surgical medical procedures. It, we would not look into the injury SOC under the medication errors and other product use errors uh, and issues, but rather look for uh, surgi the surgical and medical procedures SOC because this verbatim relates to, um, to a, a medical treatment and some of you have already proposed this. So let me check for, for instance, therapy change, so something quite vague. And here we have, so I'm warned that my uh, search is limited to one SOC. Here we have the therapy change. And if I do a right mouse click and go to the browser, I can look into this HLT and see what other PTs could be representing our verbatim here. Therapy change, so therapy regimen change. Then I have the therapy cessation. This was not reported in our instance. It was just that um, the therapy was postponed, it was temporarily interrupted. So here we have our term, temporary interruption of therapy. So this would, um, um, this would represent our, our condition. And in addition, we know the reason for, for this um, interruption. It was the sick relative, if I enter relative, and COVID, I do not, this would be too specific, but I have to clear my selection. This you have, that's why the warning is really important because otherwise you won't get hits, but here we don't get any hits. So let me check for relative. 
death of relative, ill relative, sick relative, here it is. And if I go again to the browser, you will see that we end up in social circumstances stock because this is not nothing that if directly affects the patient. It's a social circumstance, uh, a family issue, and it's under dependence, sick relative. Now let me switch back again to my presentation. Here we are. So what could we learn from this example? We had to understand the event first, not making any assumptions. So not assuming that there was an exposure to COVID-19 um, of the patient because his close relative fell ill. So we should not make any assumptions and we ch should check the browser for suitable LLTs taking our verbatim as the basis, code as reported, the basic MEDRA rule. And so our final suggestion in this instance is to code to temporary interruption of therapy under PT therapy interruption and LLT PT sick relative. Any questions, Jane? No, we've got no questions or comments on that one, Caroline. If okay, anyone... then I hand over back to you, Jane. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next example, how to code, is that the report says, friends say she's withdrawn after her surgery for oral cancer. So again, this is one we carried over from last month. Our first thought is always, is this verbatim clear enough? Do we need to seek clarification? And when we, if we're happy with that, what's the nature of the withdrawal? What do they mean when they say she's withdrawal, withdrawn? And is it something that we can find a combination for the withdrawal and the cancer or the surgery and the cancer? Or do we need to split this and select multiple terms? Those are our first thoughts. So what would you code this one to? Use your browser and have a look. So we've got I think these are some coming from the previous example, treatment delayed. Not sure if we've got a bit of a glitch there, technical glitch. We see we've... I'm not sure that's working exactly right. We seem to have your examples from the previous question, Caroline. I might, we might have to look at that one. Withdrawals. So yeah. now we're seeing some some of the new ones. You can still put your your comments in. Social withdrawal. Somebody's suggesting withdrawal. So let's have a look at the browser and see. Apologies if that one didn't work for you. I'm going to switch now to my browser up here. Go to the web-based browser from the home page. I'll do it exactly as you would do it. So if you haven't yet logged on, you can follow along. Let's start with the words we've been given, withdrawn. If we don't have anything with withdrawn, I'd search for withdrawal. But let's start with the word we've been given for withdrawn. So we've got two options come up as LLTs, withdrawn and withdrawn from social contact. So let's just check the hierarchy of this. We should always look at the hierarchy because withdrawn could mean something else. It might mean something to do with treatment or drugs being stopped. So let's have a look here. We can see that actually both of these have the same hierarchy. They're both under the same PT of social avoidant behavior. I can do a right hand mouse click and go to the browser, view that. But that seems quite good because the report we had was that her friends say she has, she is withdrawn. So social withdrawal or withdrawn seems to be I'm quite happy with that because it mentions social, it mentions in the report her friends. So that I think that's a good match. And let's have a look at the uh, the cancer and the surgery. Oral cancer was what we've been given, haven't it? Let's have a look at for that one. She had surgery for her oral cancer. We would maybe check that the oral cancer hasn't been captured elsewhere, already reported separately. Here, we've, if it was particularly if it was in a clinical trial, we've got we can look down. We've got lip or oral can cavity cancer. Oral cancer stage unspecified seems to be a good good match. We don't know the stage, so that would seem to match quite well of that selection. So here it's the PT is lip and or oral cavity cancer. And as we would expect, we can do a good see on the right hand side, 
that P2 does um, in the neoplasm system organ class. So I'm happy with that, happy with the hierarchy for, to capture the oral cancer. And then we want to capture the surgery. So I think it's unlikely that Medra would have an oral cancer surgery. We don't know exactly what cancer was done, uh, what surgery was done. So let's have a look and look for cancer surgery, see how specific we can be here. Where's the PT for that? I can do a right hand click again, go to the browser. It will be within the surgical and medical procedures as we'd expect. And here it is down here, it's cancer surgery. That's in, underneath that. Is there anything more specific? Nothing relating to oral. So that would be the best that I can find on that one. Let's go back to our slides. So our learning points there is that we do always try to understand the reported event first, recognize what are characteristic signs and symptoms. So this would be if, if, you, if you had a diagnosis and you had signs and symptoms, we'd be looking at is withdrawal something that's very typical? And if, if it was, then you might not capture the symptom as well as the cancer itself. But in this situation, it isn't something related to the cancer. It's a complication of all that she's been through. So that's why I'm, sep or I'm coding it separately as well as the cancer itself. And if I was unsure or if it really was important to the particular clinical trial or the drug, I would ask for perhaps clarification of the surgery, perhaps, or something else, if it was really important to, to what I was looking for. But based, all things being equal, I would assume that this would, these are the three LLTs I would select. Social withdrawal with a PT of social avoidant behavior. Although it's listed as a psychiatric condition, it's a symptom or a, uh, an observation which is best linked into the psychiatric system organ class, which is the primary assignment for it. The LLT is oral cancer stage unspecified, and the, then we capture the cancer surgery with that LLT. So that would be our suggestions there. Any comments on that one, Carol Ann? Do we have? Yes, one, one from Martin. He he found an, a term oral cavity neoplasm surgery. Oh, but this of course doesn't capture the the malignant condition. So yes, that's that's not a bad. It, 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 I I would like the fact it says cancer, but um, what and what's the PT for that? It's the PT as well, is it oral cavity? neoplasm surgery so yes that that would be an alternative wouldn't it depending on if you want to capture the site or you want to capture the cancer in the report yeah any other comments or questions thank you martin for that no further comments further comments thank you i'll move on to the next one then if you have any further thoughts you can always send them in the next example we've chosen is paraneoplastic night sweats in lymphoma. This is one that's been requested a couple of times by a previous attendee. And again, we ask ourselves, is it clear enough? Is there a combination for night sweats in, in lymphoma or do we need to split it? So referencing, what does paraneoplastic mean? Well, just for those of you who may not be familiar with this, we did some referencing and we found that a paraneoplastic syndrome is a set of signs and symptoms occurring in people with a cancerous tumor. They develop when the malignant tumor releases a substance, so a hormone or protein, which affects a certain body system, or when the body's immune system releases a substance, which is an antibody meant to kill the tumor, but damages healthy body cells in an autoimmune response. And these paraneoplastic syndromes are developing about 20% of people, particularly those with um, people with cancer, particularly breast, lymphatic, lung, ovarian cancer. So that's, that fits with what we've got reported, that it, it is, so perhaps we could consider this to be a paraneoplastic syndrome. And then the, the reference went on to list some of the symptoms. If you look at the last line there, it suggests the symptoms may include fever, loss of appetite and weight and night sweats. So this would fit with what we've got reported that it, it could be considered a paraneoplastic syndrome. So which LLT would you select here? You can select as many of these as you wish. We've given you a selection rather than asking you straight out for the the first one for you to give us. What would you suggest here? 
await. I couldn't give you a moment or so for you to select. Would you code the night sweats and the lymphoma and the paraneoplastic syndrome? Would you code it to oncologic complication that would seem to capture it? Or would you seek clarification? Or maybe one or several of those. Yes, we've got, see the numbers are rising. I can see how many votes we've had so far. Seems to be slowing up. People are still voting. Okay, so let's see how your thoughts lie. Here we are, and the highest number of you have gone for paraneoplastic syndrome, probably based on the reference. And then you've also selected night sweats and lymphoma. But a few of you would like to seek clarification. So that's where the final selection of our audience today. So let's browse and see. Is there anything we can see additionally? Oh, I missed my browser. There we go. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the paraneoplastic syndrome. Paraneoplastic. Let's see if there are any other paraneoplastic terms in Medra. So we've got... So I'm not going to look at the synonyms because it seems that the synonyms have taken a neoplasm and para and neoplasm. They've they've taken the um, neoplasm, neoplastic has taken it uh, and looking for synonyms that match part of the word. So that's not actually relevant. So I'm going to look at the contains only in this one because these are the relevant terms. And as you see immediately, Medra does include a number of paraneoplastic symptoms here or conditions. So we can look down, we've got, is there, would there be a paraneoplastic night sweat? So seeing as there are so many conditions reported, I'd be looking for a paraneoplastic night sweat. Maybe there would be something there that could combine the, the concepts. I don't see anything looking down, but we do have the paraneoplastic syndrome that we gave you in the multiple choice. So that's probably the closest we can get there. Let's look at the hierarchy of that term. Paraneoplastic syndrome, the PT is paraneoplastic syndrome. And if I place my cursor on it, you can see here on the right hand side, it's, um, it is primary to the neoplasms system organ class. Here we are, paraneoplastic syndrome. There's nothing with the, the night sweats and the lymphoma. I can just do a double check to see. I'm not expecting there to be anything a lymphoma and sweating. It's not, it's a symptom or a, a co-manifestation, but it's a it, complication really. No, nothing there in combination. So I'm back to seeing I can't combine them. So the, the question I'm now going to be asking myself is, is, is night sweats part of, is it a symptom of lymphoma or is it just a complication or something which tends to happen, not, not the lymphoma itself, but part of this paraneoplastic syndrome. So based on the references and what I've seen in the browser, I would be looking, there's no combination term. I'm looking for synonyms with the other cancer terms. Split and select the closest LLT for the symptom and the malignancy separately, and that's what I would do. I wouldn't regard the sweats as a symptom of the, the cancer, more something that happens as a complication of through the paraneoplastic um, syndrome. So personally, I would select three LLTs here. I would be looking for the night sweats, the lymphoma as the cause, and if it was a clinical trial, you might look to see has the lymphoma already been captured. Maybe all the patients have lymphoma. That would be something you could consider whether, to make sure that is captured in one way or another. And I would also look to capture the paraneoplastic syndrome based on the references that we've seen. But it, it, if depending on your situation and whether you're able to capture a second term for that report. The night sweats is the most important symptom to catch, capture there. Okay, any thoughts or comments received on this one so far? What does our group think, Caroline, on this yeah, one? Martin is supporting uh, this approach and says uh, they are the paraneoplastic syndrome uh, is the most severe condition, so this should actually be captured together with the night sweats because there is no combination term, but and then also the underlying condition, the lymphoma. 
Well, that's good to hear. Thank you, Martin. Caroline and I, we had a chat about this, didn't we? And we we came with the same conclusion. So thank you for that. Good to hear that we're all on the same page on that one. Thank you. Yeah. Almas is commenting that uh, why are we uh, considering the, the night sweats? Yeah, because the night sweats are, are, are a symptom or specific to the paraneoplastic syndrome here. They have uh, nothing to do with the lymphoma. So the, the lymphoma is causing the paraneoplastic syndrome and the symptom of the paraneoplastic syndrome is, are the night sweats. Yes, it gives us more clinical information by capturing the both together. And I do hope our, our attendee who asked for it is with us today. So thank you for that suggestion. Now, the third example I'm going to do in this block is something that was reported as malignant down, malignant down. So again, you look at this and have to, I had to do a double take here and see what exactly does this mean? Is it clear enough? What's being reported? Can we reference it? And if we can, what's the best LLT? So referencing, we found this article from um, that explained it, malignant down is a synonym or a, a more colloquial expression, I suppose, for a condition called acquired hypertrichosis lanuginosa. And this is also referred to as hypertrichosis lanuginosa acquisita, a paraneoplastic hypertrichosis lanuginosis, or malignant down. So they're all synonyms. And again, we can see here the word paraneoplastic should jump out at you. This is another complication of having a cancer. So normally, hypertrichosis lanuginosa would be a congenital disorder, and it explains here that it because these hairs normally present from the third month of fetal life to the end of gestation, and they would normally be shed completely before birth, but sometimes the baby can be born with them. But it can also be a complication of other conditions. It can be acquired later in life. Often it might be due to cancer, but it might also be due to a, a non-malignant disease. We did some referencing. We found it could be malnutrition with anorexia nervosa, for example, hyperthyroidism, or even HIV and AIDS it might be a complication of some drugs as well. Um, so it, it, the malignant form of the acquired condition looks exactly the same um, as when it is associated with the non-malignant disease. But in this scenario, it's due to a um, malignant down that explains that it's due to a cancer. So this is the references we've done. Again, it lists the cancers there, particularly lung, breast, uterine, colorectal, lymphoma, and bladder cancer. So it may be our same example that we had from the previous patient. So that's what we've done in our referencing. Acquired hypertrichosis lanuginosa is what we would be looking for. So what would you look for here? What would you code it to? So use your browser and you have a look, hypertrichosis. Trichosis lanuginosa, hypotrichosis. So we've got a difference of opinion here among our audience. Hypotrichosis seems to be the most common choice. This is a bit of a mouthful, this one, first thing in the morning. Yeah, seems like a lot of you agreed there on hypotrichosis. So let's, when we have a look at the browser, we'll have a look at these two suggestions that you've given us. It's interesting to see that you're divided in your opinion. Okay, so let's move on in the interest of time. Let's browse ourselves and see together. So let's have a look at the first suggestion we were given, which was hypertrichosis lanuginosa. Let's see if that is in Medra. I spelt it right, hypertrichosis anuginosa. No, I'm not seeing that one in Medra. Have I done something wrong? What have I done there? Hopefully I've not. Let's just try that word and see if I've spelt anything wrong. No. So I'm not seeing that one that you suggested. Let me know if I'm doing something wrong here. Let's just have a look at hypertrichosis. See if that picks it up. So we've got hypertrichosis as an LLT there, which has got a PT of hypertrichosis, and that's in the skin and subcutaneous tissue disorders. 
So that's a skin thing. We don't have a, we have the congenital hypertrichosis. We don't have any others there. So if we know it's not congenital because it's malignant down, it's due to a, um, a, a, a cancer of some sort of malignancy. Let's have a look at our paraneoplastic just to make sure. I don't remember seeing anything that was like that, but just let's have and make sure we're not going to have a look at something to do with that as we've just looked at that example. Nothing there. No. So I'm just going to have a look. So we want to make sure it's, it seems like I agree with the majority of you looked for, um, look at for hypertrichosis is the best we can do. However, I'm just going to do one thing that you sometimes see us do. I'm just going to double check by switching my browser to supplemental. This is where we're able to see terms that have been approved for release in our next release of Medra what we call supplemental terms. They've been approved, but they haven't yet been released. So I'm just going to do that same search for hypertrichosis. Because sometimes, and look what we see here, we have two terms here that have just been approved. They will be released in the next version. Acquired hypertrichosis lanuginosa. There it is. It's been added. So maybe when our, our attendee suggested this term, they may have even sub submitted the request themselves to have it added. And there's an additional one of paraneoplastic hypertrichosis. So recognizing that this is a condition commonly seen with some cancer patients and that we could select that one. So in the next version of MEDRA, that's the PT for it, the hyperneoplastic, paraneoplastic in the next release of MEDRA, we'd be able to up version. But in the meantime, it seems that hypertrichosis is the best we're able to do. So you see there what we've done, our thought process. We've referenced the medical condition, looked for synonyms, and we're looking to capture the condition and the specificity particularly. You always need to check the hierarchy to make sure you're not coding into a congenital sock if you know that the condition was developed later in life. And our final suggestion is, as most of you said, hypertrichosis, and we would up version for version 25 to acquired hypertrichosis, lenuginosa with a PT of paraneoplastic hypertrichosis. So, do we have any comments or thoughts on this one, Caroline? Well, not on this one. Martin had another comment regarding the lymphoma and the paraneoplastic um, night sweats. He said that. Um, um, sometimes it's really um, difficult to differentiate paraneoplastic symptoms from the cancer symptoms, especially when uh, it comes to lymphoma. But in, in the instance, in our example, the paraneoplastic was really an attribute for the night sweats. So it was really reported as paraneoplastic night sweats. So the night sweats were um, caused by, by a paraneoplastic reaction. And that's why we, we said that we would combine those uh, both and the night sweats, that the night sweats were not um, related, directly related to the lymphoma. That's right. Thank you. That's a comment we hear quite a lot, isn't it? Some people say in my, when I do face-to-face -face training, people say, well, I don't have a medical background as such. How can I be clear on what is a characteristic sign or symptom for any disorder? And I think our advice is always, if in doubt, it's better to overcode, isn't it, Caroline, and to capture something else, capture the symptom separately. If you are that unsure, capture it separately um, rather than miss it out. Yeah, and we have another comment here from uh, Serene. Uh, can I ask the suggestions given? Do all of them have to be coded for the verbatim, or um, can we just choose either one to code? So, no. With the with the lymphoma and the night sweats, the lymphoma needs to be captured somewhere. So depending on if you've already captured it, maybe it's already been reported separately, or it might be the indication for the trial. Then you've got the night sweats you definitely need to capture. And it was our assessment when we considered this that because the paraneoplastic had been mentioned, we would code that to paraneoplastic syndrome because it was mentioned in the verbatim that we gave you. 
and we referenced it and it was it is typical of a perineoplastic as part of it but it's not the only thing so it's worth capturing the two together both the sweats and the perineoplastic syndrome if it's in drug safety it's easier for you to capture several LLTs for one report no okay. more questions Good. Well, with that, I'll hand back to you, Caroline. Thank you for your help there. Thank you. So here I am back again you with did. the next example. Thank uh, you, Jane. You need to share, Caroline. Oh, yeah, we are. It's come through now. Good. Yeah, it takes, takes a moment. <laughs> In the next example, it is reported that a patient suffers fatigue, brain fog, is unable to concentrate and has difficulties remembering words due to the treatments for breast cancer. Well, the verbatim is quite clear with the exception of the reported brain fog, which seems to be a colloquial term. So what is exactly reported here and what is the underlying condition? Can we find a combination term for the reported information? So what would you suggest? Which LRTs would you select LRT or LLTs, fatigue, brain fog, unable to concentrate and difficulty remembering words related to treatments for breast cancer. Cancer fatigue, yes, so this was one symptom of the patient, fatigue, and it was related to the breast cancer, so it's a nice term, that combination term. Cancer fatigue and poor concentration, Cancer fatigue, breast cancer, yes, this is the underlying disease. Foggy feeling in head for the brain fog. Cancer fatigue. Now, how would you code the brain fog? And uh, also difficulty remembering words. Foggy feeling in head, concentration impaired, memory impaired. Fatigue, poor concentration, cancer fatigue. What about the difficulty remembering words? Any suggestion for this one? Would this be covered by the concentration difficulties? Okay, thank you for providing your, your input here. Word finding difficulty, yeah, mental concentration difficult. Thank you. So let's look into a reference. We know that the underlying disease of the patient is breast cancer and that the reported events relate to the therapy for breast cancer that most probably includes chemotherapy. So when entering brain fog and chemo into your internet browser, you will get hits that relate to chemo brain. Here a reference from the Mayo Clinic, they define chemo brain as a common term used by cancer survivors to describe cancer-related cognitive impairment or cognitive dysfunction. We will have to decide whether we would subsume the reported unable to concentrate and difficulty remembering words under the confirmed diagnosis chemo brain, because these are typical characteristic for the diagnosis chemo brain. Based on the PTC guidance for medra term selection, the preferred option here um, is to code the diagnosis only. But you may, of course, also decide to take the alternative approach and code all related signs and symptoms for a given diagnosis um, in addition in your company. It is really up to you, uh, but you should document this decision in your internal coding conventions and apply this rule then consistently. Now let me again switch to my browser. as indication for use or 
for um, as as um, medical history term um, breast cancer search. Here we are, quite a number. So we see that here Medra makes a difference between male breast cancer and female breast cancer, even on PT level. We know this was a she, so it was a breast cancer female. This would be the correct term to select. Then uh, all of you have found the combination term for fatigue in relationship to cancer. Here is the cancer fatigue, very nice con uh, combination term that would capture the fatigue that was caused by the cancer. And also the chemotherapy fatigue is grouped under this cancer fatigue. Now, when I enter brain fog, this was actually reported, exactly what was reported. I do not get any hit. But if I enter chemo brain, we found this with our reference. Then I find a direct hit, an LLT, and it's grouped under cognitive disorder. So there is a specific term in MEDRA grouped for chemo brain under PT cognitive disorder. If you decide to um, then split the diagnosis and uh, related signs and symptoms, then you would need to look for um, like concentration difficulties, was, um, was um, un unable to concentrate was reported. So concentration may be difficult. Here we are. Use word stems in order to make your search broader. Mental concentration difficult. Right mouse click, go to browser. Let's see what we can find. Here we are. Disturbance in attention would be the PT. And we see terms like uh, concentration loss would be suitable, unable to concentrate was um, reported, or poor concentration. So both would be suitable LLTs. Now, what about um, difficulty remembering words? If I enter remember, I don't find anything. If I enter memory, some of you have suggested some memory terms. Memory blackout, memory deficit. These are more memory impairment. These are more vague terms. It's grouped under amnestic symptoms, but doesn't capture what uh, the exact type of this memory deficit, so that um, there was a difficulty remembering words. So if I enter um, something like find words, somebody has suggested trouble finding words or difficulty finding words. Word finding difficulty, here we are, aphasia. It's grouped under aphasia. Again, let's look into the hierarchy in order to find potentially better terms, better LLTs to capture our condition of interest. So the difficulty remembering words. And you see that under aphasia, you have quite a number of terms like anomia, uh, aphasia nominal, uh, amnestic or amnesic aphasia. So um, quite a number of terms and you may not be fully familiar uh, with. So we would need to look into some references in, in order to fully understand what would be the most specific LLT to select in this instance. So let me switch back here. And uh, when checking the different aphasia terms in Dorland's, we can see that anomic aphasia reflects what has been reported in our verbatim, the difficulty remembering words. Anomic aphasia, defective recall of words, such as names of objects with intact abilities of comprehension and repetition. So um, it can also be called amnesic or amnestic aphasia, nominal aphasia, or anomia, and stands for a defective recall of words. 
and we saw all of these LRTs under PT aphasia. So these would be the closest matches. These are our learning points. We first had to get clarity about the expression brain fog and use medical judgment to understand its characteristic symptoms. We then searched for suitable terms capturing the relationship to cancer or cancer therapy. We will have to code the symptoms that are not characteristic for the chemo fog separately, so the cancer fatigue, and decide whether we would follow the preferred option of the PTC guidance or take the alternative approach and split code the characteristic symptoms of the chemo brain separately. And here are our, our, our final suggestions. We would code the cancer fatigue separately because it cannot be considered a typical symptom of the chemo brain. We would code the brain fog to LRT chemo brain under PT cognitive disorder. And we could either subsume its characteristic symptoms, unable to concentrate and difficulty remembering words under the diagnosis chemo brain, or take the alternative approach of the PTC guidance and code them separately to either LLT poor concentration or concentration loss under PT disturbance in attention and LLT amnestic aphasia under PT aphasia because this LLT most closely reflects the reported difficulties remembering words. Any questions or comments? Jen? Yes. We have a couple of questions here. We have, a, we have a few comments on this one. So the first one is the breast cancer. Can you just address whether we would also, wouldn't we code the breast cancer separately? Yeah, I've shown it in the browser. So it would be either the indication for use or the study indication, or it would be um, medical history term. Yes, you're right. Um, and it, so that's that one. Then there was also well, just, a female it would be. Hmm? Well, no, do we know it's a female? That's another thing that was actually come up. We don't know it's a female. Oh, yes, that's true. I thought <laughs> yes. we have one verbatim that says she. <laughs> I didn't that's... have the exact wording of this verbatim in my mind. Yeah. Yes, that's true. It's then true. Cancer... Yeah, <laughs> I was assuming it was a female. Yes, that's Ooh. true. That was my thought. Too. Breast cancer. My brain automatically goes female. But yes, Stephanie's quite right. It's, we don't know that. Then there's a couple of questions about um, are we assuming that chemo is meaning chemotherapy? Because the treatment hasn't been been um been we we haven't the treatment hasn't been specified here. All we know is it's treatment for breast cancer. So isn't it assumption that by going chemo, we're saying chemotherapy? Is um, is that an assumption? It's it's kind of an assumption, but we we are told it's related to treatments for breast cancer, yeah. and the treatments for breast cancer usually contain chemotherapy. So and and chemotherapy actually is not well defined. So what what to subsume under chemotherapy? Um, I think the different medical schools, if you look into the um, into into uh, the internet, um, you will find different answers to this question. Mm. So that's why we were, were looking to the chemo brain and then came up with this um, um, chemo brain in LLT in Medra. It's an assumption, yes, it's not exactly reported, but it's related to the treatments for breast cancer and um, brain fog, of course, is something and the, the symptoms also relate to it, unable to concentrate and difficulty remembering words. So these match the, the, the symptoms or are, these are characteristic symptoms, signs and symptoms for the chemo brain. So that then it's there's just a the colloquial term. So it does not really, must not mean that it's directly related to chemotherapy. It's just related to cancer therapy. Um, so then we've had a comment about uh, the, could these symptoms also occur with strong morphine therapy and not necessarily chemo at all? I didn't get this one. Could could the symptoms also occur with something like strong morphine therapy? The treatment for the breast cancer might be strong analgesia, which um, is not chemotherapy. I yeah, that's, that's, we, that could be the could be the fact, yes. We took the unable to concentrate and difficulty remembering words 
uh, related to treatments for breast cancer as, as, a, as a guidance so that these the fatigue the brain fog unable to concentrate and the difficulty rem rem remembering words were related to the treatments for breast cancer it could be of course be morphine but we took the brain fog and the unable to concentrate in difficulty remembering words and looked at the uh, definition for this chemo brain and thought that this would be um, a good match together with cancer fatigue or chemotherapy fatigue um, but um, you're right um, yeah, strictly. It really depends. you would make it dependent um, on on other case information yeah we just took this verbatim as is and tried to find the best approximation so we've got some other comments caroline um, the, so one of the comments following on from that, Martin suggests it could be a complication of anesthesia for surgery, for, following surgery for the cancer. Potentially, yes. Tre the way it's reported as treatments for breast cancer is how we took it. That was it a big assumption to be chemotherapy? Um, but you, as we've just explained, you, you, you are all strictly correct. It could be an assumption. And then that's your choice. You would prefer to code the individual symptoms and that's fine we we yeah. um then there's um a suggestions for what about memory loss in the remembering words or um is anomic yes. aphasia closer to the lrt of anomia under the pt of aphasia what about anomic aphasia anomic aphasia yeah i took the amnestic aphasia because it's uh, it's closer to the amnestic amnesia but uh, I'm, 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 I'm normal. Yeah, so it's it's uh, sometimes you have uh, multiple choices like poor concentration or concentration loss would be two LRTs uh, that would fit the unable to concentrate as well. So on the LRT level, matter is really very granular. Sometimes you have uh, two, three, four choices you can uh, choose from, representing the same same condition. So being synonyms. And then Emma's saying, what about if she were to use memory loss? Would that be uh, would that be different? Could no, you use memory loss? Memory loss would be yes. It's 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 um, difficulties remembering, but it's a difficulty remembering words. So it's an aphasia. It's more specific to call this to aphasia because memory loss could relate to many different um, um, disorders. Or this here, it is uh, clearly reported that the patient had difficulties remembering words. So, so then we've had another suggestion that does anomic aphasia mean the difficulty in pronouncing the words? So it's difficulty remembering words, which is different from not from difficulty pronouncing the words, which I think is, I think Pilar is suggesting the amnestic or is better than than anomic, anomic. Yes. Is, is that, I think that's... Mm -hmm. the, yeah, this is what I showed in Dorlands. So Dorlands is always the main or the primary reference for MEDRA. So anomic aphasia can also be called amnesic, amnestic, or nominal, or uh, aphasia, or anomia, and always uh, refers or describes a defective recall of words, Difficult. such as names of objects. So this, these are all to be considered synonyms, and this is um, how you would code this uh, difficulty remembering words uh then we've got we're getting a lot of questions on this from caroline For, we haven't captured the poor concentration what do you think about did you think that the foggy feeling in head covered the poor concentration or should we have also captured the unable to concentrate separate well we i think we we thought that would be wrapped up with the chemo brain but if you're yeah. not happy with the chemo brain then you would be capturing the unable to concentrate as well wouldn't you with a separate LLT? Yes. then you would if you if you would not uh, consider the chemo brain appropriate based on case information or because you think it's yeah. it's too much an assumption in this instance then you would uh, code this a brain fog to foggy feeling in head um, but you would then also need to, because it's a symptom, it's not, it's not a, it's not a diagnosis, so to say. Then you would also have to to code, split code the other symptoms that are reported here: the unable to concentrate and also the difficulty remembering words. So, uh, 
that that's great so we just wrap i'm just going to wrap this one up caroline in the interest of time so we've martin agreed with you that it is borderline what the discussion we've had there is it are we diagnosing when we code chemo brain but it's probably okay in this scenario but it is an individual choice and it's however you feel comfortable i'm glad everyone's got so many thoughts on this one and our last comment is just to clarify it's difficulty remembering words those are all symptoms which are related to treatments for breast cancer. It's not difficulty remembering the words related to treatments. It's not a case that the patient can't remember the name of their treatment. It's not those words that they're forgetting. It's a general forgetting words, being unclear, feeling foggy. All that is the, the list of symptoms, all of those symptoms related to the breast cancer treatment. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you all for your comments on that one. That's great. It's like being yes. in a classroom. It's always fun for us too because you get your your um yeah you are providing us with additional views on on these verbatims. Yeah. We learn at the same time. We're not yeah. we're not perfect in everything. So thank you for your input on that one. So let's continue. Our next patient suffers an injection site reaction with erythema, induration, and pruritus on the upper arm. So I think we can all agree that this verbatim is clear and precise, but it combines different injection site reactions. And the question is whether we can find a suitable combination term in this instance in MEDRA, or whether we can prioritize parts of the information or whether we need to split code. So how would you approach this verbatim? Which LLT or LLTs would you select or would you split or would you try to find a combination term or subsume this under a more general term? Injection site reaction, erythema, induration, pruritus on upper arm. Injection site reaction. So many of you would subsume these reactions under injection site reaction. Under a more general term, any other suggestions? Seems that most of you would assign a split the individual injection site reactions. Yes. Here we have somebody who would split these reactions, but most of you split to injection site erythema, injection site induration, and injection site proitos. Perfect. Thank you. So let us look into the MEDRA term selection points to consider guidance here. Normally, we are asked to prioritize the event rather than the affected body site, as you can see in the first example here. A skin rash on chest would be coded to skin rash. Um, there is no available term for a skin rash on the chest. So we would always um, um, prioritize the specific event that is reported, not its localization. But uh, administration site reactions actually are an exception. In such cases, body site information has priority, meaning the fact that the reaction occurred at an administration site. And you can see in the corresponding example here, cyanosis at injection site um, should be coded to injection site discoloration, because if you would code this to the actual specific event, cyanosis, this may suggest a generalized disorder. And um, this is clearly a localized reaction, a local re, uh, reaction. And in this example, selecting cyanosis would result in loss of important medical information and miscommunication of safety uh, information as well. So in the, um, in the instance of administration site reactions, you need to capture the fact that um, any reaction at these sites are administration site reactions. You need to find a suitable term under all these terms for the administration site reactions. Now let me switch to my browser again. Oops. Here I am. And look at 
the, in, into the general circ. Let me collapse all here and go to the general disorders and administration site conditions because I know that all administration site reactions are grouped under this uh, system organ class. All these uh, reactions are grouped under one HLGT. Here it is with six different HLTs and among those we also find the injection site reactions. And here you see that we have a long list of injection site reactions, many, many PTs, and we will find one for the erythema. Here it is, injection site erythema with injection site hyperemia and injection site redness underneath. Then we have one for the pruritus or pruritus. Here it is with LLT injection site itching. And the induration is also available. Here it is, <coughs> injection site induration with LLT injection site sclerosis. So you see there's a clear differentiation on PT level. So we are asked to really split code here and um, capture both the fact that um, these were local reactions at the administration site plus the specific condition. Looking at this verbatim, we learned that administration site information takes priority over the specific body site, um, and that splitting will be necessary if no combination term is available when more than one administration site reaction is reported. And when such events are relevant for the safety profile of your products, you may consider more detailed internal coding conventions. And you could consider scenarios like um, handling of verbatims that describe a specific administration site reaction, like, for instance, a red patchy rash at an injection site. And you would need to decide whether you would split and consider the addition red and patchy as attributes describing the rash um, or code the injection site rash only. So if you would split all these attributes into separate um, PTs or whether you would find consider these as uh, attributes of the rash and just code the rash. Or how would you deal with verbatims that describe an administration site that develops from redness into bulla and answer? Would you split codes and, and this would be reported in one verbatim? Would you split or would you code to the worst case scenario, namely the administration site answer? You will also, would also have to decide um, what to do when no suitable term for a specific injection site reaction or application site reaction is available, but a specific administration site reaction term is. Would you code to the vague injection or application site reaction because there is no specific uh, PT available for the reaction, or rather code to the specific administration site term that captured the specific event? Also, rules could be defined for frequently reported administration site reactions like, for instance, inflammation based on its cardinal signs, uh, namely redness, swelling, heat, warmth, pain and loss of function to avoid splitting. So you could define that warmth and redness could be taken as minimal criteria to qualify for inflammation or you, would, you could consider warmth, redness and pain as minimal criteria for uh, to classify as an administration site inflammation. All this needs to be considered and can be should be documented in your coding conventions if this whole area is, is important for, for, for your products. So and here are our final suggestions for this verbatim and uh, some of you have already proposed to split here LLT uh, injection site erythema, same PT, LLT injection site induration, same PT, and LLT injection.
the code. What shall we do here? Which LLTs would you select? So more, of, more than one may apply. Application site skin breakdown or tissue breakdown associated with device. Adhesive plaster sensitivity, device adhesion insufficient, medicinal patch adhesion insufficient, or product adhesion insufficient. What would you select? How would you classify a patch? A drug patch. Is this a device? What is it? Numbers are still increasing, you're still voting. So skin breakdown at drug patch site, non-adhesion was reported. Now let's look, most of you would classify as application site skin breakdown and medicinal patch adhesion insufficient. But we have split of opinions here. Some also would consider this patch as a device or some would consider this just as a product to not make any, any assumption here. Let's close the call. Here we are. Well, no specific guidance. If you look into the PTC documents, in order to find more guidance, you won't find uh, uh, clear guidance. Just one similar example where an uh, on-body infuser fell off the patient's arm and um, the patient then missed the dose. It's in the PTC companion document. So here, um, LLT drug delivery device fell off the skin is grouped, uh, this one is grouped under PT device issue, a very vague term, and it is reported that this then caused a dose omission, which was of course unintentional, so it would then be coded to missed dose in error. So can we assume in our, in our case, in our report here, that um, the patient missed doses due to the non-adhesion? Maybe she missed doses, but this was not reported. The medicinal patch may have been replaced immediately, so we don't know. Doesn't help much here in this chapter. So let me look for suitable terms in the browser again. So let's see what, whether we can find a description for application site, because this was one of the um, options that we had application site skin breakdown. If I look here, application site. For the purposes of MEDRA, an application site is considered to be the first surface that contacts a topical medication in the form of a cream, lotion, or patch, e.g. an estrogen hormone patch. It does not pertain to other methods of drug delivery, such injection or infusion by catheter or other means. So, a drug patch, a medicinal patch, um, is, uh, can be, if there's a reaction of such a patch in the patient, this can be classified as an application site reaction. So this is important to know. Um, with this, we know that um, this can be applied to medicinal patches. Now let's search for breakdown. See what we can find here nervous post-operative skin breakdown yes it's under skin disorder skin graft tissue breakdown associated with device so this is a medical device site erosion um, and wound breakdown hmm. here it is application site skin breakdown application site erosion so this would be our term, the best approximation to our verbatim. Here we are. Let's see what other LLTs are available. Application site erosion, excoriation, skin breakdown. So an exact match to what has been reported here. We know that we can apply or classify these reactions of the drug pages to application site reactions. So this would be, um, would cover the skin breakdown at the drug patch site. Now, what to do with the non-adhesion? If I look for adhesion terms, 
and search. Of course, the adhesion is a medical condition as well, that can abdominal adhesions, etc. So here we have a device adhesion, but we it's not a pure device what we are looking at. It's it's a combination product. It's it's not a device only, but it is a small device containing a drug. <clears throat> so it's a combination term, it's not a pure device. And um, therefore, the device adhesion in decrease would not be a suitable term. It's, it would be under device issues, NEC device adhesion issues. So let's look. Here we have a very nice term, medicinal patch. What we have is a medicinal patch because it's a drug patch. And we have an insufficient medicinal patch uh, adhesion, product adhesion issue would be the correct uh, PT here. Let me switch back to the presentation. What we can learn uh, from this example is uh, to not add or subtract information and we should not interpret or infer more than uh, is stated. We should not assume that the patient missed doses due to the non-adhesion or that the reported non-adhesion was due to the skin breakdown with discharge from the erosion, for instance. Remember the ba basic MEDRA rule, code as reported. We would search for the best matching LRTs for both the administration side reaction, the application side reaction, and the reported product quality issue. And again, consider more detailed internal coding conventions if administration side reactions are relevant for the safety profile of your products. So here we are. Our final suggestions would be application site skin breakdown under PT application site erosion and LLT medicinal patch adhesion insufficient under PT product adhesion issue. Any questions? Yeah, Jane? We've, we've had a few comments. Generally, the comments are in agreement with you on this one. Somebody suggested device adhesion insufficient, but you've addressed that one in your explanation. But generally, our group are in agreement. We've had some interesting comments from the previous example, Caroline. I lost the audio for for a, a few seconds, so I didn't wasn't able to give you these following the last example. They're talking about injection site reactions here. So this goes back to our previous example with the injection site reaction, erythema, induration, and pruritus. And they're talking about um, the sometimes being useful to capture the, the importance of capturing the individual symptoms because it gives you more information potentially about the grade and about the perhaps the nature of it, what's caused it, whether it's a needle issue or an allergy or whatever. And then we're talking about CTCAE criteria and using the grading severity of injection site reactions. So if you don't capture the individual symptoms, you may not get an idea for the um, severity of it. And um, Maria Giuseppina suggests that the, her, the company includes the injection site reaction with the grade greater than or equal to three among the ACs, AESI, so that it is important to keep the correct grade of the reaction. Yeah, Adverse I agree. Effect. Yes. So because the severity of these reactions could, could differ. So, yeah. It, it gives you more clinical information, doesn't it, about the yeah. nature and the severity. So, thank you. Yeah. Generally, every, people are in agreement. Thank you for that, Caroline. Mm -hmm. Then I hand over back to you. Thank you very Thanks. much. So let's see what we've got in our next one. The next one we have is rash anterior chest wall, secondary to ECG dots. So here we've got sticky things again on the chest this time. Is it clear enough what's being reported? And can we capture the relationship between the rash and the ECG dots? So we can probably cover this one quite fairly quickly after you, Caroline's given us such an explanation of the device stickiness last time. So. What LLT would you select here? Is it an application site rash? ETG electrode site reaction, medical device site rash, rash trunk or medical device complication?
If you've forgotten it, Caroline's put it in the chat. I've just realised I forgot to put the last one in. Caroline, I am sorry. So here, what's how we're doing here? Not so many of you voting there. Slower voting on this one. Let's see how your thoughts are lying. You can still vote, but let's see how the thoughts lie. Predominantly there, I think most of you would select DCG electrode site reaction. Some of you would select medical device site rash. So when we go to the browser, we'll have a look at the, both of these and we'll look at the hierarchy and see if we can distinguish between them, which would be better. Application site rash, a few of you have chosen and some of you would choose rash trunk perhaps because you think the area is greater than just under the dots potentially. So, interesting. So, this is the final vote today from our group. The winner there is ECG electrode site reaction in votes. So, let's go and have a look in the browser. Oh, I need to switch my browser back to the default. So, I'm just going to switch it back to the default view. So here, let's have a look then. Let's have a let's look at electrodes and see what we come up with. We'll find that term that was in the multiple choice. ECG electrode site reaction. Sorry, oh. sorry Jane, are you sharing screen? Oh, oh, sorry. Am I not sharing my screen? I'm sorry. There we are. Sorry, Caroline. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm back in no. the browser now. So I've searched for electrode. I'm sorry. I... Uh, Thank you, Uni, for pointing it out. So ECG electrode site reaction, there's the LLT. Medical device site reaction is the PT. So at the PT, when we look at the hierarchy, we lose the specificity that it's an ECG electrode. It just becomes medical device site. So if we, if we then go over to the browser, let's go over to the, and do a right-hand click and look at that in its primary placement complications associated with device. There's the PT for a medical device site reaction. Well, if we select DCG electrode re site re reaction, that's where we're going to go to the PT. So if we look at the PT above that, one of the brother and sister PTs, we see that there is a similar term of medical device site RAF. So let's see what's under that. The only LLT under that is medical device site RAF. That was one of the other options we gave you in the multiple choice there. So here we can see the difference at the PT level. And actually, when we look at those PT side by side, medical device site rash, that gives us more information than just medical device site reaction. So although this ECG electrode site reaction looks better because of the specificity, actually at the PT level, medical device site rash is a better one, a better choice. So that LLT is actually a better choice there for that one. And then we've got the rash at the chest wall. So the question we have, let me go back to my slides so we can have a look at the slide again. We can look at the term again. Um, is rash anterior chest wall secondary to the ECG dot? So the question we might have is, is, is it broader than, is it across the chest wall? Or is are we comfortable that it's related to the dots and that we're capturing it adequately by just capturing the site? Or is it broader? And this is, again, this is where your medical judgment comes in. How much do you think that rash extends? But I would be looking at capturing the relationship to the device. So the medical device site rash, I would be happy with. So we would capture the specific events as the rash and the relationship to the patches. We have shown you how to check the hierarchy and then by prioritizing, you can look for the most appropriate one. And it might be something that you want to consider an internal coding convention when you would classify something as a local administration versus um, the condition itself. So rash on the chest, that uh, maybe is why some of you would have selected rash on trunk, rash trunk. But uh, my choice and what I would put here is that I would prefer to see the relationship capturing it as a device site. So our choice here would be medical device site rash. Any other comments on that one, Caroline, or thoughts on that one? No, no comments, no questions. So do you think, should we try and do one more? 
before we yep. talk about that. Yep. So our next one is bruising from attempted blood draw. Now, is this clear enough? What's being reported? Well, it seems like it's another site. I immediately think of that being another site term. Um, can we capture the relationship between the bruising and the procedure? What's the most appropriate LLT? Well, it doesn't say that the bruise is at the site of the blood draw, but that's how I would see that. I don't think that's an assumption unless it's a patient who's needed to be held down, for example, for the procedure. I would assume that the blood, that the bruising is at the site of the blood being taken. Um, but that might be something you have your thoughts on. We've given you a selection here of terms we found in the browser. Would you select vene puncture site bruise, vessel puncture site bruise, vascular access site bruising, phlebotomy, poor venous access because it says attempted blood draw, or would you just think bruising is safer? What would you select here? What's your thoughts? Yeah, let's see how your thoughts lie. Oh, we're really spread on this one. Differences of opinion between vene puncture, vessel puncture, and vascular access site bruising. Some view we there prefer just bruising. So before we look at the browser, I'm going to show you that's our final choice so far from your, your suggestions. I'm going to have a look at some referencing. So we did some research beforehand to show you, those you may not be as familiar, venipuncture or venipuncture spelt differently is the process of obtaining intravenous access for the purpose of venous blood sampling, also called phlebotomy or intravenous therapy. This is performed by list who does it. Venipuncture is one of the most routinely performed invasive procedures for five reasons. And the reference we found, which is actually a Wikipedia reference, lists that blood monitoring, let, um, obtaining blood for diagnostic purposes is the first of those five. So venipuncture seems like a good choice for what we've had reported, blood draw. What about vascular access? Well, vascular access is a quick, direct method of enabling the entry or removal of a device or chemicals from the individual's bloodstream. So this one is slightly more of a procedure. It seems like they're putting something in. It may be a device um, that's being inserted, vascular access device, or it may be drugs that are being inserted. It seems from this that a vascular access device is something a bit more permanent, something a bit more um, substantial, perhaps for repeated blood sampling, a, a central venous pressure reading, or administration of medicine and fluids over time. So that seems to be the difference here. Vascular access seems to be more related to giving of drugs, and a vascular access device is something that might be more permanent or more semi-permanent fixture. So of those, I, I think I prefer the venipuncture. Let's have a look at the hierarchy of these terms and see. Maybe there's something in there that caused some of you to choose one off over another. We've got venipuncture site bruise here. And there's the LLT. The PT is vessel puncture site bruise. So the PT is the same there for venipuncture as the other one we gave you in the multiple choice quiz. And we can see here that it's um, primary to the general disorders. We can see the full hierarchy. So venipuncture site bruise, if I do a right hand click, what? Well, Let's have a look at the other one. So vessel puncture site seems to be related to that one because it's the PT. So the other option we gave you was vascular access. So before we go over to look on the right hand side, let's have a look at the vascular access bruise. I should probably put in there. Vascular access bruising, site bruising, vascular access site bruising. There's the LLT there in the list vascular access site bruising, and the PT of this one 
is that this one goes to injury poisoning and procedural complications. So this one is captures procedural complications, whereas our previous example, if we go back, I do my back in my search, I'll do that search again, venipuncture site bruise, the hierarchy of this one went to the general disorders, which actually includes administration site reactions. And you could argue that, well, we're not actually administering anything here. So does that hierarchy mean that we shouldn't be selecting this one? So this is the pros and cons. You could be considered a, va a vascular access or could be considered a venipuncture. Vascular access seems to be more forgiving of drugs although the hierarchy of venipuncture actually puts it under general disorders and administration site conditions. So this is the way my mind would be going, weighing up the two options. And we'll go back to our slides to just show what we think. Our learning points is that we would code as reported without adding or subtracting anything. So some of you might then say, well, the simple bruising term is actually the one which doesn't assume anything because the site isn't mentioned. How much of an assumption would it be to code it to a site term? Distinguish between vascular access site and the simple vessel puncture site reactions, vessel puncture site being the PT for venipuncture. Consider maybe you could have an internal convention here to help your coders to can code consistently with similar reported events. And my final suggestion there, I would feel most comfortable with the vini puncture site bruise, with a PT, a vessel puncture site bruise. But some of you might um, think differently on that one. Do we have any comments on that one, Caroline? Or yes, there was a, one suggestion to, to code this to procedure site bruising, but now the discussion start, starts between the attendees already. So she. Uh, um, the procedure site bruising is too general already, um, it is stated. So, and then uh, Stephanie says, and this is interesting as well, I was unsure here since the venous puncture does not actually seem to happen since only an attempt is reported here. Oh, yes. Well, yes, but if there's bruising, I would think that there's been some kind of puncture because of bruising, unless it's due to pressure or, as I say, somebody's been held too tightly or, or in some way or some tourniquet or something. But yeah, that's a that's a valid comment as well, isn't it? It's how, yeah. much, um, how much judgment do you use? So we keep saying code is reported, don't assume. And then it seems that we are making our own little um, understanding or, or of the term. So it's, it's not black and white. Yeah, but there was an attempt of venipuncture, so some, and it, it was a bruising, so somehow a, a, vas, a vessel was hit. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, another valid point is that the term doesn't say it's venous. Of course, it could be arterial blood draw as oh, well. Yeah. It's not as frequently uh, performed, but mm -hmm. of course, this, this uh, is a valid point. So <laughs> maybe vessel puncture side bruise would be the best, uh, better option here to code because yes. we don't know whether this was arterial or venous um, puncture. That's very true. I didn't think of that one. That's an example of the, like the picture with the sheep at the beginning. I never thought of that one. So that's-, that's yeah, For me also, blood draw, I thought, well, this is venous blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too, I never thought. Thank you for that comment. Just shows coding together, we, we have a more comprehensive view than and it looks like such a simple term when you first see it on the page, doesn't it? Well, I mean, I'm conscious of time here. I don't want to take up everyone's morning. As you see, we do have some other examples. We've covered nine. We have another four. I'm sorry if you came along today wanting to come in specifically for the COVID reaction, um, COVID vaccine terms. We'll cover those next month. In fact, it's not even a month's time. It's in just two or two, three weeks time, um, the beginning of November next month. So I'm going to go to the end of the slides now, just to show you the our wrap up few slides here. If that's okay with you, Caroline, let's do this. Yes, of course. Um, and we will just remind it to you all that we do these sessions every month. If you are new to our group and you've not attended previously, it's lovely to have you with us. And you may want to look back at some of the other sessions that we've done. We've, next month will be a year since we started these sessions. 
So all of them have been recorded. We'll have them all on, on our YouTube playlist of Let's Go Together playlist. So you can look back at them there. And if you go to the actual, um, if, if you go as if you were going to watch it, you can look at the description and it will list the verbatim terms that are covered in that session. So if you want to see what verbatims are covered in each of them, you have to open the, the, the video as if you're going to watch it and you can see. So that's the first point on that one to make. And here are some contacts for you. This is where we, you can um, download the points to consider document, the browser, most of you are experienced coders, I can tell by your comments, so I'm sure you're well familiar. The support documentation, the training schedule if you'd like to sign up the next month, and then our contact information. We do have a chat, a contact live chat, which pops up. We also have an online form, a web form that you can send to us, and we have some QR codes there. These allow you to join either a WhatsApp chat group or a WeChat chat group, WeChat, um, online chat um, group. And the other thing to say with the, the saying that about the other languages, we've got a Russian group, a Spanish group, a French group, and a Chinese group. We are now starting to offer Let's Code Together in other languages. So if you do, um, would if you'd like to attend it in Chinese or Spanish, have a look on the website and you'll see there are some others just recently been added but you're all still very welcome to come back to ours every month um so uh, with that we just then will give you on your polling there will be an instant survey and this is your opportunity to tell us what you thought of the session tell us what you've enjoyed or how you think we can improve also gives you an opportunity to suggest topics for another month's session or individual verbatim terms. We can't guarantee that we can cover them all, but we look through them each month and select from them. So we may not be able to cover it next month, but we'll cover it in a future session, perhaps, where we can group it with other similar terms. Next month, we'll carry over the ones we haven't covered today and we're looking at some terms, including next month, we're looking at doing some terms with itis, inflammation versus infection, and these kind of dilemmas. So that's the topic we're hoping for next month. So any other comments, Caroline? Anything you'd like to add that I've missed? or Nothing to add, Jane. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention today. Thank you, Caroline, for your collaboration, as always. Always enjoy doing these sessions together. <laughs> Me um, too. It's been a really good interactive one. So thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. And I hope to see you next month when we meet again early November. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.